I'm Jonathan Agnew. Welcome to the Test Match Special podcast, looking back on a really exciting second day of the England-Pakistan test here at Emirates Old Trafford. Despite a decent start from England, it's Pakistan who are very much in the ascendancy. We'll get the thoughts of a very excited former Pakistan bowling coach, Azam Mahmood, and from Michael Vaughan. We'll hear from Jofra Archer, who took three wickets, and Pakistan's batting star today, Shan Massoud. And we'll find out why Pakistan Cricket Board Chairman Essen Mani believes England should have no issues touring the country. You're listening to the TMS Podcast from BBC Radio 5 Live. And the close of play of the second day of the first Test match between England and Pakistan at Emirates Old Trafford sees England in a lot of trouble on a day in which 12 wickets fell for 279 runs. England finished the day on 92 for four, so they're 200 and 34 runs behind Pakistan's first inning score of 326. We'll go through that in a second, but to begin with, England's reply began badly with Burns out to the fourth ball of the innings. El to the left arm, quick bowler uh, Shaheen Afridi for just four runs. Dom Sibley, El to the metronomic Abbas for eight. That was 12 for two, 12 for three when Stokes was bowled by Abbas for a duck, batting well out of his crease, a ball that just held its own and beat the outside edge, 12 for three in the sixth over. Well, Root and Pope put on 50, with Root taking 22 balls to get off the mark. He made 14 from 58 balls, who had tried to cut a ball that was too close to him from Yasser, the leg spinner, and was caught behind off the bowling of Rizwan. So, from that moment on, Pope has breezed relatively to 45, has played very smoothly from 67 balls. Butler is 15, not out, 92 for four. To mention Muhammad Abbas has took two for 24 in that innings. Pakistan, well, it was a funny old day. They lost Babar Azam to the sixth ball of the morning, caught by Root off Anderson for 69, so no addition to that. And uh, shortly afterwards, Asad Shafiq was caught by Stokes' second slip off broad for seven, so that was 150 for four, and Pakistan innings really was was going absolutely nowhere. Uh, Mohammad Rizwan was caught by Butler off Wokes for nine, 176 for five, and England rubbing their hands, but then a really positive partnership, some terrific running between the wickets from Shadab Khan, who really did wind up the fielders, bringing them in, beating them with fine strokes. He put 105 on with Shah Masood, the opening uh, batsman who, of course, gave two chances yesterday on 45. Well, eventually, Shadab Khan was caught by Root off Bess at mid on for 45. And then the innings rather subsided. They lost the last five wickets for 45. The ninth man out was Shah Masood for an excellent 156 from 319 balls. Bowling wise, Stuart Broad finished with three for 54. Joffre Archer, three for 59. 326 all out. England, 92 for four. At the close of play, lots to digest uh, with Azza Mahmood and uh, with Michael Vaughan. Where do we start? Let's start with you, Azza. I reckon you've had a good day there. You'll be delighted with that. Yeah, very happy with that. Uh, I think start of the day belongs to, first session belonged to England and they were brilliant with the ball. And after that, you know, I was, uh, can't get my head around when the five overs to go and two spinner was bowling for a new ball. You're playing with four fast bowlers and you should be bowling that and they allow Pakistan to get settled and uh, I, th- I thought Shadab Khan uh, and Shan Masood was very special and uh, they put pressure on the bowlers and after that you know uh, they built up a really great partnership and then the last session was for especially for the bowlers and they were absolutely yes. brilliant uh, well we, we saw the full range there with it's just all one uh, wrist spinner of course Shadab who we haven't seen yet but you know, that, that, that pace bowling attack, it's, it's, it's got everything. Yeah, they got uh, everything, you know, like uh, different angles. Uh, Shane Shah freely bowled 85 miles an hour, creating, swinging the ball both ways, you know, asking questions all the time. And then Mohammad Abbas, he's, he's not as quick as the other two, but uh, he got enough skill and ability to uh, get any person out on any pitch. He got 10 for in... Uh, Abu Dhabi. So right. that's the skill shows from this. Point. Yeah, yeah. Well, Michael, what do you make of that as, as a day? It began so well with Baba Razam out in the first over, and well, even after that, England were chipping away. But it, it did all go wrong for them about lunchtime. Yeah, I mean, full credit to Pakistan. They're a, a tremendous cricket team to watch. Uh, they've got high-class players with a huge amount of skill. I always felt this series was going to be a step up from the West Indies series from. The skill levels, the discipline, uh, the expertise that Pakistan were going to 
throw at England and you know winning the toss batting you know I look back to Jason Holder bowling again in that third game I just think against this England side nothing surprises me when the opposing team bat first and get a decent score 326 not a massive score but it's a decent score um, it's a common trend I guess you know we've got to be honest when England bowl first and uh, and when they have bowled first continuously over the last three or four years and it's been under Joe Root's leadership um, they struggle to read the play and they have moments like as I mentioned about the two spinners bowling just not realising that moment was so important for the mm. test match England had to win that moment and you go back to yesterday after lunch they just have an, an hour's play where you're looking at what's going on the ball's falling to all parts and they just seem to lose focus when they bowl first and then the batters as soon as they get put under pressure you know, with half a score on the scoreboard before they've taken guard. Let's be honest, how we sit up here and we go, they will lose wickets. Hmm. They're going to lose wickets. It's just a common trend with England's Test match team. If they bat first, uh, I have every confidence that they'll go out when they bat and play OK. And I have more confidence when they get the ball in hand that they'll read the situation. And Joe himself as a captain will be reading the game better knowing that his team have batted whether it's because he's batted on it and the, the team have batted on it and they know the kind of lengths that are hard to face by the time they get the ball in hand but it's been a common trend for a while now that when England bowl first and then bat second both disciplines don't seem to be able to operate the conditions as well as when they bat first and it's a strange isn't it I mean, and what, it's the first why? test of the series so it, it, yeah. I don't know I mean but is it because they, they don't know when to attack or when to just to just just you know, go dry as they call it these days and just bowl for some maidens and get some control because they, they, having really kept things so tight in the morning and taken those wickets they yielded 20 odd runs in those five overs that we're talking about that's really the point isn't it that yeah it just it just absolutely it's like a pressure cooker let the steam out yeah and the, the same thing happened yesterday after yeah. lunch you know it's just I don't know I mean the basics of the game is you, you, you have to make sure that you win the first 20 minutes of every session and then you can control that session from there and how do you do that you generally start with your best two bowlers if you possibly can if they're knackered from bowling before lunch when you kind of go right who am I the next best two you know to start with two spinners and, and to kind of create this momentum for Pakistan towards that second new ball you know that was a, a tactical manoeuvre that I don't think it's at this stage costing them the test match, but I, I do see some manoeuvres out there that you know are moving the momentum of the test match within 20, 30 minutes of play. And at this level against the, against a team like the West Indies, you get away with it. And it's not being you know disparaging towards the West Indies side. They were great to watch and they came over here and played, but Pakistan are at a level up. And then you go yeah. to an India side or an Australia side, they'll blow England away. You know, the, the, the talk of, you know, I've heard in the week, oh, England want to be the number one test team in the world again. They're miles off it, Aggers. Hmm. Absolutely miles off it. I mean, they've got some quality players. They've got a huge amount of skill. But, you know, you've got to say that tactically they get it wrong quite often. And, you know, there's, there's question marks over a few areas of the team. Uh, and to start talking now about being the number one team in the world, miles off. Yeah, OK, well, that's, yeah, that's, that's interesting. It's, 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 it's the cost of every run, I think, isn't it, uh, Azur, and that you know, 326, people might be saying, well, why are you worried about that? That's only a, a middling sort of a score and a first innings of a test match. But actually, we've, we've, we've seen quite a lot happening out there, and that's mm -hmm. the point, isn't it, with Pakistan able to bowl last, one imagines. Yes, not 326, not the massive score, but uh, I know the Pakistan mindset, you know, whenever we come to England, we saw, OK, first 300 run in first innings, and then we got uh, bowlers who can get 20 wickets, and uh, it's... And we saw a lot of spin. We haven't yes. seen Shadab Khan yet. But I think England got a trend for the last three, four series, lost the first test match and win the series. Uh, I hope not that the case to the rest of the series. But uh, I think uh, one thing I would say, you know, I haven't seen Jafar Archer because he bowled the first spell in a, a, before lunch. And we haven't seen him till before tea time. I think uh, that's where uh, you want... Mm. your best bowler to bowling at Shadab Khan at that time and I totally agree well, they allowed them I wondered if he was fit he, 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 he's sort of hitting 82, 83 miles an hour and he had his sort of hands on his hips quite a lot well I think we're going to speak to him shortly maybe you know, that question will be asked yeah. but you know, there's, there's been two, two days of cricket that Pakistan have been great they really have they, they just look you, you said it on the first morning we were just sat here watching them warm up and we both looked we went they're on it this lot yes. they look like a, a well-oiled unit they're running between the wickets I've not seen a team do that before just tap and run and really frustrate Anderson and Broad and bring the fielders in and there was overthrows um, you know so Pakistan so far have come here they've clearly done a lot of thinking 
Uh, Eunice Khan, the batting cat, I don't know what he writes on his pad, but he writes every <laughs> single ball something. I don't know There's what he's up to, notes. but it's yeah. working. And, yeah. you know, you just look, they, they look, you know, got Wakar Eunice, you can see him working with the bowlers. You've got Miss Bar, he's in and around the team. You've got Mushtaq, who, who's working with the spin bowlers. And they look like a quality team. I mean, I think they're batting. They'll become under a huge amount of pressure uh, over the course of the next uh, couple of games as well. Because, you know, when you look at Shadab at six, uh, Rizwan at six and Shadab at seven, you know, it's light, very similar to England. When yeah. you look at England with Chris Wokes at seven. So I think both batting units have got some quality players and some fragility around it. Um, but this is a, a very common trend of the England side. Let's talk Josh Butler a second, because he's, a, he's had a poor game behind the stumps. Yep. You, we, we know what his batting record is. Last nine tests, average 22. Last 17 tests, averaging 24. If if England continue to play four bowlers and Stokes is kind of a, maybe just one that you can use every now and then. In other words, what I'm saying is that the wicketkeeper is going to bat at, bat at six. Could you see folks batting at six? I mean, if, if Butler's place really is under, under that sort of pressure, do you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, yeah. No, I don't. I, I, look, the keeper's got to be at seven for me yes. uh, in this England team. That's why I, I look at it and say, how, how can you be number one in the world when you haven't really got an out-and-out high-class spin bowl? You, you know, there's question marks over the keeper. Um, you know, two senior outstanding bowlers, how much longer can they go on? Um, you know, two or three of the, the, the top order, you look at the technical side of the play of Rory Burns and, and Dom Sibley. Yep. You know, you know as a seam bowler, as a and yourself, Jonathan, when you're seeing those techniques moving over to the off stump, you just know the ball that nips back. I mean, I would have sleepless nights facing Mohamed Abbas, I'll openly admit that, and I think Dom <laughs> and Sibley will have a, a, quite a number over the next three weeks of sleepless night, knowing that that ball's going to be away, 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 boom, he's going to nip one back. Yes. It's going to be so hard. He might have to come out of his crease, which England tried to do, but that ruins your rhythm as a player. I found it so hard to do that because you're just ruining your rhythm of the way that you play. You look at Ben Stokes, he came yep. out of his crease by a metre, yep. and then he gets a good one, but he's playing on the move. He's not playing with any kind of stability or balance. Um, so already Mohamed Abbas has got England thinking of doing something different before they'd really faced a delivery, which tells you that they've done a bit of research and they feel that batting outside of the crease is going to nullify LBW and bold. Well, he got an LBW and he got a bold. So that tactic didn't quite work today. Yeah. And um, the keeper stands up anyway. Yeah. Correct. It, it's, um, you know, it, the, the England test team, it, it, they're great to watch in a way because you're never quite sure what you're going to get. But now we do know what we're going to get when the opposing team bat. In English conditions, I think Stefan Schultz, who, who works with the BBC, read a, uh, a stat out about if the opposing team come here and get over 180 in the first innings, batting first, I don't think England have won for, for many, many tests in this country. So always bat first against England, I would suggest. This is the TMS podcast from BBC Radio 5 Live. Let's get some reaction now from the England camp. And we can hear from Joffre Archer with Henry Moran. First of all, how do you read the match situation? Uh, pretty even at the moment. Um, obviously, the new ball did a bit first yesterday and then it got a bit easier to bat on. It's pretty much gone the same way again here today. Obviously, Joss and Poppy, you know, made it a lot easier than the first 15 overs and hopefully they can go on and bat as long as possible tomorrow as well. And presumably the, the evenness disappears if that partnership is broken early tomorrow. Well, not really, because then Baba, we got we got Baba pretty early this morning as well. So, you know, if it does, then it would pretty be even again. But hopefully we can do one better, you know, and, and put on a really big partnership tomorrow. And that pretty much just sets us up for the day ahead. Three wickets for you. How do you feel your bowling is at the moment? Yeah, well, I bowled well last series as well, just in getting the wickets. You know, I thought I bowled well again and, and probably was really lucky to get, get those two later on. But... You know, as long as I'm bowling, obviously everyone wants wickets, but um, as long as I'm bowling, well, that, that's enough for me. The wickets will come. Cricket usually evens itself out, so, you know, I'll just be patient. This series has got two stellar seam attacks, two of the, the finest in the world. How exciting is it to be a part of that? <laughs> a part of it where you're bowling, but um, I don't think anyone would like to, well, obviously, you'd like to score some runs on it as well, so um, I think everyone will have a part to play because you said that the bowling is so good. I think every single run will be crucial. The week that you spent in that hotel watching on, how tough was that during the West Indies series? Um, well, <laughs> it is what it is and I'm just glad that it's over. You know, I'm back here playing and doing what I love. So, you know, that's the, that's the most important thing at the moment. 
And just finally, social media-wise, you're one of the more outspoken people on social media. Do you enjoy that interaction and speaking to people on Twitter and, and responding to things? Well, yeah. Um, obviously, you still have to watch what you say because, you know, people can spin things totally out of, out of um, proportion as well. So, you know, um, you know, try to, try to get a little bit sarcastic <laughs> with it as well. But, you know, I think a lot of people use social media as we have seen things and getting away with it and just like the guy last night as soon as I actually said something he, he, um, he made his profile private very quickly so I mean if you're gonna say something at least stand by what you say and you enjoy you know having that command standing up for cricketers and sports people that perhaps don't respond as often as you do yeah you do and to be honest like after I sent the tweet out, I feel like guys actually got behind me on WhatsApp and stuff. I didn't even realise that they had seen it. Even Stotsy was one, he, um, he, uh, he was quick to show me that the guy even follows him as well. So, you know, um, I, I think we really got to stop people from, you know, getting away with a lot of stuff. And, you know, <sighs> can't say it all the time. Everyone has their own opinion, but if, if I don't agree with their opinion, I, I, I'll say it. The TMS Podcast from BBC Radio 5 Live. Some interesting thoughts from Joffre Archer with Henry Moran. Henry also spoke to the Pakistan centurion, Shan Masood. Uh, well, Shan, many congratulations. Three hundreds in three test matches. How do you rank that, that innings that you've played over the last couple of days? I think in terms of the contribution, the, the situation, the scenario, not having played any test cricket for three months, and then everyone going through COVID, uh, not the easiest of times for it. For, for everyone around the world. So coming back without any match practice, I think um, on the surface, uh, yes, it feels that it's been a great achievement, but you have to give credit to, to the management who's put in a lot of effort over the five weeks, to the 29 guys who've, uh, who've uh, made sure they haven't had any issues with each other. I think we had, we had a good five weeks and, and leading into the test and, and we felt well prepared. And uh, we, we thought that we, we had some, uh, as batsmen, we faced some, uh, um, some tricky conditions in, in Derby. But I think it's set us up in good stead, uh, the way Babur batted uh, yesterday, the way Shadab batted today. So I think it's, it's helped us uh, the, the five weeks that we've had under our belt. Talk me through the emotions of reaching that 100, particularly considering the tour last time over and, uh, and coming back and performing like that. Look, I think cricket, again, it's a funny game, but it's a game that allows you second chances and that's the beauty of sport, uh, like, like any other sport. So, again, I'm not, I wasn't putting myself any, under any pressure. I just wanted, I, I feel lucky that I'm representing my country at this stage. Uh, we're playing the game we love uh, when, when the world is facing a global pandemic and we're playing in this beautiful ground. So, uh, we, we were just grateful and, and there, was, there was no sort of uh, reasons to put any, ourselves under any pressure. Again, it's a world-class bowling attack. Um, you've got two guys who've taken 500 plus wickets and that speaks volumes for themselves. They've got guys that are sitting outside uh, that, that are good enough to fit in any international squad. So, again, uh, the thing was just to put yourself in the moment and then just capitalize on anything you got, stick to a game plan. And, and I think that that stage went quite quickly when uh, after lunch when I got from 77 to 100. So I think it was all the, all the hard work that was put in those 200 odd balls before that. It was exciting enough watching up in the commentary boxes, the early stages of the England innings. What was it like there in the middle? I, uh, we were very excited in terms of our bowling attack. Um, I think the three paces, they complement each other very well and then they put the ball in the right areas and then they got some purchase of the wicket. So we're excited. Um, hopefully uh, this, is, this is a bowling attack that, that serves Pakistan for a long time. In terms of the match situation, it couldn't have gone much better today for Pakistan. It's a good day, but again, England bad deep down. Uh, they've got some great batsmen to, to follow even now. Uh, they've got good records. Even when we played here last year, they, they ran us around the ground. Uh, so again, we can't be complacent. Um, we have to back this day with another day. That's the beauty of Test cricket. Things change pretty quickly. Uh, it's, a, it's a game of five days and we have to make sure that we're on the ball and we produce performances that, that back a, a good day up as well. And just finally, that you spoke about the, the five weeks you've had, the 29 players that you've been with. There will be tough times, of course, in, a, in an environment like this, but how much has it brought you together as a side? I think that, that, that's important. And even with the test side, there's, there's been this, uh, we had a tough Australian tour together, 
When we came back to Pakistan, uh, we drew the first test against Sri Lanka. In the second test, we got out cheaply uh, on a pretty uh, flat batting wicket. But the camaraderie between the boys, um, there weren't any fingers pointing between bowlers and batsmen. I think we fought it out. Bowlers got Sri Lanka out on, on 280 and then the batsmen backed it up with, with four centuries from the top four. So it all started there. So I think as a test unit, we've been quite close. Uh, we enjoy each other's performances. Um, and having the T20 guys and all the other guys, the reserve guys as well, the, the 29 people have been quite close together. And it's been a wonderful atmosphere that's been created by a wonderful management as well. A joy to watch you perform the last couple of days. Many congratulations Thank and you. Uh, speak to you soon. Thank you. You're listening to the TMS podcast from BBC Radio 5 Live. At lunch today, I spoke to the PCB chairman, Eshan Mani, about whether England should tour in Pakistan once again, the chances of them playing India soon, and first, whether the players needed much persuasion to come and play in England. Look, there was some uh, nervousness, There's amongst, particularly among the players uh, and the families. Uh, it seemed our uh, CEO did a great job in uh, speaking to them, giving them the assurances, working very closely with the ECB's team uh, to uh, provide the level of assurance that made the players comfortable. Uh, the, the you know, it's very tough for uh, young players to come and then be confined to a hotel. Uh, that was going to be another challenge. I think we had one player who whose family was nervous and he pulled out. But apart from that, everyone else had been prepared to come. We had some issues, uh, yeah, you know, you'd know in, uh, in Pakistan and India, in fact, uh, you get the joint family systems where you have the whole family, siblings, parents, grandchildren living together. So it's this concept of social distancing, not having co a social contact becomes a, ch a serious challenge. And in the first round, we had, you know, about nine or 10 of them who tested positive. Uh, so we had to run through uh, further uh, steps of uh, testing with them. Um, but uh, uh, they're all here, which is a great thing. And it's, uh, it's been a unique experience for the players uh, to be, while they've been confined uh, in a hotel, in a bio bubble, the ECB have been fantastic. They've gone out of the way to make them comfortable. Uh, I have nothing, I've heard nothing but praise for the, way, the arrangements. Um, and that's helped. Uh, but um, uh, my big concern is that you've got, you know, you're, when you're coming into play test matches, you need to have the um, match fitness. You have to have the exposure to actually playing in a match competitively. Our boys played two matches uh, between themselves. Uh, one of them got interrupted by rain quite badly. Uh, so perhaps a little unprepared uh, from a playing perspective. Uh, but they're young, they're very enthusiastic. They've got a great support team with them. Uh, so it's great to be here. Now, inevitably, there's been talk here about a, a, a quid pro quo, if you like, and some, some pressure from, from the Pakistan cricket board as a result of, of their coming here and helping England out to keep their cricket fluent and, and obviously uh, cash rich, as it were, as opposed to being bankrupted, which could have happened. Um, and therefore, it'd be obviously persuasion from Pakistan, therefore, for England to, to tour there. Now, where, where, where do you stand with that, Isan? I mean, is that, is that, is that a fact? Um, I wouldn't use this series as a leverage in any way. Pakistan is safe. We've been hold, we've now had Sri Lanka back. We've had Bangladesh back. We had the fabulous MCC team back with the Kumar Sangakara. He captained the side, and he was actually on the bus that was attacked in 2009. There cannot be a better endorsement of that uh, of where we are in Pakistan today. Yes, there has been some nervousness by countries, but I do not think there will be any reasons for England not to come in 21, end of 21, 22, when they're due to come. How would it work? I mean, we, here we have the bio bubble, uh, sort of protection against well, a pandemic, obviously, a virus. How would it work, or how could you see it working in, in Pakistan, where it's, it's actually a, it's a, a security issue? Could you see it a sort of a lockdown again? Uh, no, well, it's not a lockdown at all. Um, what we have done is, uh, certainly for the first couple of teams that came, uh, yes, had a very tight security, sort of like head of state level of security. 
yes, in hotels, controlled going out. But by the time the MCC got there, they wanted to get out and play golf. And I think they played golf virtually every day they were there. Uh, you know, some of the team. They went out sightseeing. They went to restaurants. Um, um, Michael Atherton was there to uh, do a program. He was out on, you know, uh, in the evenings on his own. Uh, uh, well, he was taken out, uh, but he went to restaurants. He, he he got around, and I'm sure if you asked him, he would say he didn't feel any any way uh, sort of uncomfortable. Uh, yes. So I think you know we've got uh, still got nearly uh, two years before England come, and I hope that by then things will have really settled down, where the, there'll be more freedom of movement. Uh, I just don't think there's the need for the level of security we've been giving the teams. In fact, some of the Sri Lankan team uh, complained to us that they wanted to go out, go shopping, you know, go just get out of the hotel. Uh, so it's a balance, but, you know, you can't take risks to begin with. But as the levels of comfort uh, by the people who are visiting Pakistan improves, uh, a lot of this has got to do with perception of the country. People, when they come to Pakistan, are pleasantly surprised that uh, what they thought they would get and what they actually see are two different things. I suppose part of the issue is that, is that with, an, with an England team, there's a big media pack and there are travelling supporters. And, and uh, you know, they, I suppose, you know they, they, they would want to come. The media would want to be there. So it, it's, it's a big undertaking for, for all that number to, 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 to be secure? I, do, I don't think that, you know, the, uh, this concept of what is secure um, uh, is uh, really an illusion. Uh, well, take New Zealand recently. Uh, you know, uh, it was unfortunate. Uh, the Bangladesh team was there. Lucky they weren't in the mosque when the attack took place. Um, you, you, you will get incidences like that around the world. You're not getting them in any major city in Pakistan today. Um, it, it, is, it, is it a good thing or frustration for you that England have toured uh, Bangladesh, for instance, when there was uh, a big security issue there, and of course Sri, Sri Lanka as well? I mean, you know, England, England have travelled in the past to areas that that you might not necessarily feel are are, are secure. So, does that does, is that a good sign for you, or is it frustrating that 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 you, know, you, you understand so, what I mean? No, no, um, it's not frustrating. Uh, there, were, there was a time when even I would have said, don't come right now. Uh, but I honestly believe, uh, and you know, uh, the MCC is an endorsement of that, that they felt so comfortable being in Pakistan. Um, and uh, we had one, uh, we've had the chief executive, we've had Tom Harrison from England, We've had, uh, with a board direct, the director who was a, a, a former uh, security man, I think police force. Uh, when you saw the security arrangements and the safe city projects we have in Pakistan, where, uh, if, for example, in Lahore, they've got sort of mo uh, camera monitoring movements through the city, not around the cricket grounds. Uh, his reaction was that if we had things like this in England, there wouldn't be any street crime. Uh, so we have the infrastructure in place. Uh, and one thing is clear. I mean, I, you know, I will never, in fact, none of us would ever want anyone to come if we weren't comfortable hosting them. Uh, but I'm also very clear we're not going to play in third countries. We either play in Pakistan or we won't play. You see, that's, that's yeah. quite a, a determined stance then, isn't it? So, so, if, so, so you're, you really are, you've, I mean, the, the UAE has done its bit as far as you're concerned. It's, it's, it's hosted you through that, that crisis, but it's now time, you think, ready, that if you don't come to Pakistan, well, that, that, <laughs> the, the games won't take place. Look, the um, price we've paid for UAE, not only in financial terms, that's been very high, uh, and yes, on financial terms, it's cost us about $50,000 per day per, uh, extra over what we've had paid in Pakistan. But far more important is for our players to have the home crowd behind them, to actually play matches within Pakistan with that sort of support. For our youngsters, if you're going to spread cricket in the country and make that strong, the youngsters and the kids have to come and see the matches. 
and see cricket being played. And I'll tell you, the hunger is astronomical. We, on the, in the Rahul Pindi match against Sri Lanka, three days had been virtually washed off. Last day, no chance of a result. We had a full crowd. Uh, that's the hunger. Uh, when Kumar brought out the MCC team, uh, they played at the Gaddafi Stadium, uh, you know, a club side playing against one of our Pakistan Super League franchisees, uh, one of their teams, and we had about 18,000 people. The passion in the country, but unless we capture it and unless we actually uh, are able to get that out to our young people, uh, eventually cricket will get diluted by other sports. So we cannot afford to do that. It's important for the development of the game in Pakistan that we have uh, cricket in Pakistan. Um, we, uh, yes, we have to make certain arrangements to make sure that players feel comfortable, uh, uh, which which we'll always do. Uh, uh, so it's 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 not as you know it's not saying you take it or leave it for no no grounds, and we've had uh, one of the European uh, Anglo-Saxon I should say uh, chief executive and presidents who came out uh, at the end he was asked uh, what do you think he said I can't think of a reason not to come. What do you think the impact of of the coronavirus is going to be on? international cricket i mean you know so the the whole global structure of it we've already lost uh, the world t20 of course uh, in 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 october november well you know there, there there are lots of those down the line i suppose and they just, they'll, they'll move it back but just generally the countries being able to play against each other and and to keep to sustain the world test championship of course as final that's supposed to be next year that the whole the whole structure how, how, how do you think it'll be impacted it is going to be impacted. I mean, England had to pull out of the tour to Sri Lanka after actually having got there. They had to come back. Uh, we've had similar cancellations uh, by other countries. Um, and what's going to happen is that all these tours that have been cancelled will sort of bunch up. They've got to be somehow worked back into the, uh, in the bilateral series. Uh, and it will not be possible for countries to do that easily and quickly. Uh, the, re the pandemic is increasing at a fast rate in parts of Asia. Uh, it's getting better in some other parts of the world. Australia, we thought, was doing really well till Melbourne happened. Um, but it's still better, far, far, far ahead than some of the other countries. So I think it's going to, this is going to have an impact. Uh, and I keep telling, you know, uh, I'm back at the ICC as representing Pakistan. And what I tell people is that it's going to take three years to catch up uh, with yourselves, get your tours back, get your finances sorted out. Uh, so it is a major challenge for countries. Uh, uh, for some of them, it's a critical challenge, uh, you know, for the very fact that some of them uh, literally depend on these iconic tours, England to the West Indies, yeah. big one always, England to Sri Lanka, big one always. Uh, because it's not only, you know, the income they get from the game, it's the Bami Army tournament turning up, the hotels, the restaurants, uh, all of that contributes to the, uh, the to the country and to the uh, to the game in a particular country so it's going to take time uh, i think what the members have to do like we've done here for england is to go out of one's way and make sure cricket carries on and make sure that no country uh, is sidelined where they cannot play enough cricket to sort of continue to be playing cricket yeah what about you and your neighbours? They said, I've got to ask you about that. <laughs> you haven't played together in a bilateral series for years. Do you see it's any sad, light at the end of that tunnel? It's very sad because when you look at the ratings of an India-Pakistan match, it's higher than any other match in the world. I would, I would expect somewhere between 200 to 250 million people would watch that match. And the numbers are amazing. Um, we have a very simple approach in Pakistan. We are not going to let politics come in our game. Uh, for some reason, our neighbors use that. They think they're using it as a lever, uh, uh, but we, we don't engage in that. So I do, we, we've, we're not going to ask them to play with us, but if they are willing to play and want to play and approach us, we'll, we'll approach it with an open mind, totally open mind. We play them in the ICC events. We play them in the Asian Cricket Council events. Uh, we have no issues with that. Uh, the only loser is the is the fan. 
uh, in the fan engagement that you lose out of it. Uh, is just it's very sad that that doesn't happen because people are passionate and and the sad thing is when you have cricket and people to people contact there's no better way of improving relations between countries yeah is there, is there any dialogue at the moment at all between you you and the bcci uh, not really, because the BCCI itself is in a sort of uh, a flux at the moment. They've had a change of board. The people who are there are still waiting to see whether they're allowed to carry on by the Supreme Court, uh, because officially their terms have expired and um, uh, they're uh, asked for the courts to change the system uh, so they can stay on. So I think until they have certainty, there's no point of speaking to them because they might be in transition. Yeah. So, so to be clear, you 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 would happily send a Pakistan team to India, or you'd be happy to host an Indian team within Pakistan. Absolutely, from a cricketing perspective, we have no problem.